All right, you're good to go. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon. This is the board of directors of the East Bay Regional Park District Legislative Committee meeting on Thursday, January 26, 2023, and we're beginning at, oh, a little after 1230. And I'd ask the recording secretary, Flora, to take roll of the committee. Absolutely. First up, we have Chair Colin Coffey. Present. Present. Director Olivia San Wong. Here. Present. Director Dennis Waspy. Here. Welcome. I can also recognize uh, our committee alternate, John Mercurio. Director Mercurio is present. I will also recognize staff and presenters in no particular order. Uh, we have our federal advocate, Peter Umhofer, who is present. Our state advocate, Doug Houston, present. Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, Eric Feeler, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst, Lisa Baldinger, Government and Legislative Affairs Executives Assistant, Yuli Padmore Assisting, Grants Manager, Katie Hornbeck, Chief of Planning Trails and GIS, Brian Holt, Senior Planner, Naoma Laval, uh, Jeff Rasmussen, Katie Hornbeck, I believe I hopefully recognized, and myself, Laura Chantos, legislative assistant. And from PrimeGov, we have Alex Gonzalez assisting. Uh, Chair Coffey, I can state the ways that members of the public can submit public comment. Okay, go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. You are welcome. The East Bay Regional Park District intends to hold meetings through either an entirely virtual platform or a hybrid of in-person attendance with the board of directors, designated staff, and limited members of the public to participate in person at Park District headquarters and through the Park District's virtual platform, Zoom, members of the public are strongly encouraged to wear masks when inside district facilities. The Park District is providing live audio and video streaming for those members of the public not attending in person. Public comment may be submitted, one, live via Zoom, Two, via email to myself at fcsontos at ebparks.org or by voicemail by calling 510-544-2024 as noted on the agenda. If there are no questions about the meeting procedure, we can begin, Chair. All right, thank you. Then we'll move to the first agenda item, which are... Uh, Comments report from the Deputy General Manager on all of us. Thank you so uh, much. Oh, you made it. Yes. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. So I just wanted to take a moment to say that we do have a full agenda and I'm looking forward to the board's discussions today. And the first uh, to frame the discussions, I just want to take a few moments to talk about the, uh, the, the winter storms or the atmospheric rivers that we just experienced that have been truly historic. And it speaks to our changing climate and the impacts to our park district and our regional lands. So after many years of drought, historical rains have channeled through our parklands with uh, a lot of ease. And we believe that we have incurred a, about, from the first assessment, approximately $10 million in damages. But the final figure is likely to be threefold that, if not more. And that's important to uh, take into consideration as we consider a legislative program, given the fact that we will be leaning on our, and working with our elected officials, with uh, the uh, FEMA and Cal OES to secure funding to repair those damages in the short term. In the long term though, our approach of storing 125,000 acres of land um, we'll be using our ecologically sensitive vegetation management to build a resiliency for extreme uh, weather events, including um, the flooding, the erosion, and the wildfire, and the drought. So we're certainly leading the way, and I, and I know you know that, President Coffey. I just want to make sure that we um, let you know that we continue to lead the way uh, at the state level in advocating and securing for funding for our vegetation management 
that sets up our ability to be resilient to a changing climate and certainly in line with the state's 30 by 30 goals. So our, our government affairs team at the general manager's office will continue to advocate towards that end. And, and we intend to share similar remarks with each of our members in our delegation during our upcoming state advocacy days. So we have a lot here and, and we're very excited about the team that's uh, working in collaboration with you to make all this, to bring all this forward. Those are my comments. Thank you. And again, uh, I know the board is very grateful toward management and our workforce in getting the parks uh, cleaned up and most importantly made safe for our public for their very eager and quick return uh, to the parks and the trails uh, following the deluge that we experienced. So I just again want to congratulate everyone in the organization for being able to do that and do it so quickly. Uh, we'll move now to government and legislative affairs report. Uh, we have, um, and I'll guess we'll hear from later Peter and, and Doug, and I want to welcome you guys. And also I'm really looking forward to coming back to more uh, normal uh, federal and state advocacy with you folks by being able to visit uh, both of you in your venues, <laughs> respective venues, uh, hopefully this year. Um, and, and we haven't done that, I think, now in three years. So that is something we're all very much looking forward to. So thank you. Uh, Eric? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair Coffey. Eric Feeler, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, and I uh, will be joined in the um, two presentations by uh, management analyst Lisa Baldner. Uh, wanted to just share with you the schedule for Sacramento. Uh, our advocacy days are January 31st and February 1st, so next Tuesday and Wednesday. And as you indicated, President Coffey, first time we've done that in a number of years and we're looking forward to it. Uh, and we are trying it a little bit more, trying to pace it a little better in having uh, two days uh, rather than trying to jam everything into one day. So we will be treating this as a board conference for um, the overnight stay. And so as such, we've developed a, a, a schedule that we'd like you to view these uh, events and opportunities as sort of like sessions at an advocacy conference, I mean, at a, at a conference and um, we've talked to a number of you already about preferences in terms of which uh, meetings you may choose to join uh, and want to lead in or which ones you might might uh, might not uh, participate in. Uh, so our, our beginning of the of the uh, two days will be at, at graciously that Doug uh, Doug's office um, uh, in Sacramento. So we'll all meet there at 9.30, uh, spend a little time reviewing the schedule, particularly if there's any last minute changes, as you know, uh, often there are, uh, and any other questions the board might have. And our first meeting, and, and this will be a little bit of a unique experience for us because the Capitol is under, uh, well, it's closed, uh, and the meetings will be taking place in what is called the swing space or Capitol Annex, uh, so it's in a different building than we're used to. Uh, it's laid out a little bit easier to find um, offices. Uh, and so in, in the swing space, uh, the members have individual offices, but there are also uh, on, on the, in the middle of each floor sort of common meeting areas. So some of our meetings may in fact be in those common meeting areas given the size of our delegation. Uh, but our first meeting is uh, with Assembly Member Lee, uh, and uh, we have the three issues there, and I might call on Lisa just to talk a little bit about uh, that agenda because she will be our primary lead in that in that meeting as a staff person. And Olivia, I believe, is our primary will be our primary board me me member in that um, in that meeting as well. So, Lisa, do you want to just say a couple words about Randall Creek? Happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lisa Baldinger, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst, and um, we are also very excited to get back to Sacramento, to meeting in person, to engaging in person with our elected officials. Um, and then for board members that this is their first time joining us in these visits, 
Um, our hope is that you as electeds are able to connect directly with uh, your counterparts in the assembly and the Senate um, and hold conversation. And so you all should have received electronically a memo with background information um, on each of the focus topics for these meetings, as well as the two topics we'll be chatting about across all of the discussions, our admin limit legislation and the interest in having a conservation core based out of the East Bay. Uh, we will also have hard copies available for you in Sacramento. Um, so if you forget to pack it, please know we have we have you covered. In the discussions, um, our hope is that the talking points in that packet can help guide you. Um, however, staff will be present in every meeting to support with any questions and take notes on necessary follow up should the member have a specific question um, that we need to circle back to on. We always want to give the correct answer, not a speedy response. Um, these are these are trusted relationships and just by way of context on the Coyote Hills project, uh, we are uh, moving forward uh, our Coyote Hills uh, access and restoration project, which is a large climate smart project. However, unfortunately, due to lack of funding, a bridge over Crandall Creek was not able to be included in that project package. And so this is really an opportunity for Assemblymember Lee uh, to uh, work with us to hopefully advance some funding uh, for this bridge. Uh, it would create a, a safe passageway over the creek um, and help to mitigate against uh, hikers and visitors uh, following maybe a, a desired or a bootleg path through the creek disrupting the ecosystem. So we're excited about this opportunity for a viewing deck for wild, um, for, for waterfowl and others. Um, and so if you have any questions on this project or any other, as you're maybe studying uh, over the weekend, please do not hesitate to reach out to Eric and I would be happy to answer. Then uh, exciting opportunity at 1130, we will be presenting Assemblymember Bauer Kahan, the Radke Championing uh, Advocacy Award. Uh, we did give them the option to have the award presented in a park in, in district, uh, but once they uh, knew that we were going to be there in person with our board, uh, they chose to, to receive the award. And they're, uh, well, actually, they're going to have a conference room where they'll accept it, and we'll be doing a photo op and um, we're hoping that President Waspy, President of the Board Waspy, will be able to present the award, and uh, our other board members, uh, Director Eccles, and others will be able to, and and uh, Sam Long will be able to say a few words, hopefully, at the presentation, and then after the presentation, we will be having a conversation with her team. Uh, our main focus for their office, uh, she's currently the chair of the Park and Wildlife Committee. Uh, and we do recognize that our organization would benefit from the cutting the green tape efforts in terms of doing restoration and climate resiliency projects and having some regulatory uh, relief. Uh, there are some, some uh, programs already uh, available to us, and one of them expires, I believe, at the end of the year, so we'll be seeking renewal of that. Uh, but in addition, we want to work with her staff. She's a CEQA lawyer. She's got another CEQA lawyer on staff. We'd like to work with their team on legislative efforts to really uh, make sure that land management agencies are treated differently than developers who are building shopping malls and other, other sorts of developments when it comes to um, doing restoration and climate resiliency projects. Uh, so that will be exciting. And then uh, I, I think, I don't know if we noted that at every meeting we will be talking about our, uh, well, we'll be talking about the flood damage for sure, um, but also our uh, efforts to secure or the conservation corps, California Conservation Corps efforts to secure uh, funding to develop a permanent facility in Holly Court, Las Trampas, uh, off of Bollinger Canyon Road to house two uh, uh, forestry crews that can help the park district with our wildfire mitigation and also our trails uh, maintenance work. So we're really looking forward to working with them on that. They've made a budget request. It hasn't yet been received. And so we're going to continue to advocate for that. And then in addition, our general manager has directed us to work on seeking to raise the admin administrative limit for uh, contracts. Currently, our limit for GM approval without board approval is 50,000. 
Um, counties of population of 200,000 or more have a admin limit of 200,000. And as we represent 2.8 to 3 million people in our two counties, we believe our admin limit should be at least at the $200,000 level. The board uh, does get to decide that. It's not, it's not written into the proposal for it to be legislated. It's just we have to have the authority to do it legislatively. Uh, so we'll be We'll be mentioning that to each office as we uh, go through um, our day. One o'clock, uh, we will have lunch at Prelude, and uh, that should be a nice time to have a little bit of an internal conversation and chat and um, hopefully have a good lunch. At uh, 2.30, we will be meeting with Assembly Member Wicks, our legislative director, uh, and at this meeting, I'll let Lisa discuss the project, uh, but we did meet previously with Zach, and he's very interested in working with our office on policy as well as funding, so we're, we're excited to meet with him. And this is one of the, the few meetings I do want to note that we will be meeting with the legislative director in lieu of the elected official. Uh, Zach has assured us that if Assemblymember Wicks has even a minute to stop by and say hello, um, that she will make it a priority, but I Unfortunately, she won't be able to sit down with us on this date, um, but Zach is a supporter of the Park District um, and a good partner. And so uh, with him and the Office of Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, uh, we'll be chatting about the Restore Wildcat Creek at Brooks Road project. Uh, this is a project based in Tilden, um, where the current pathway is a, um, a hard material going through the creek, preventing fish passage, a uh, healthful water flow, um, and really just quite uh, not appealing uh, if you've been out there. And I'm happy to share some photos I have of the site. Um, the, the project's intent is to elevate the pathway to two bridges, which will be uh, ADA compliant um, and expand the accessibility of those trails at that area. And then by taking the hikers out of the creek, uh, we'll be able to restore the creek uh, to a, a natural fish ladder passageway. Um, so sort of like a much smaller version of a creek restoration than McCosker, but still just as impactful. Um, as we've seen recently, healthful watersheds are critically important um, as we're experiencing uh, changes in climate. So we're looking forward to checking in with our office about that. And then one note I do want to make on the general manager's uh, request for the admin limit is that we are currently pursuing an author for this legislation. Um, and so we hope to have an update the morning of, at our kickoff briefing at the Houston's offices on if we have an author secured, in which case we will be hopefully thanking that individual or if we're going to be bringing up in meetings um, the need for an author um, in hopes of securing one. So I did want to make that note as well. Thanks, Lisa. Um... We will go next, and Lisa will be the lead staff person in, in that meeting, and then we'll we'll probably have to split up because of time. Um, so I I will take the lead in the uh, Assemblymember Grayson meeting, and we will be talking with him about the Marsh Creek Trail extension. We have already met with his chief of staff on this issue, and I know Director Coffey, Chair Coffey, has also met with the Assemblymember on this issue. Um, and they are very interested in working with us on the trail and also on uh, mar opening Marsh Creek State Park for, for public uh, use. So that will be a good meeting and we will need to be sure and thank the assembly member for the $3 million in the budget for uh, the South of Bailey Road project at Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50. Uh, the next meeting and, and um, Director Coffey, I know you had indicated to us that you will send us uh, the, the the meetings you wanna to go to, but I'm assuming that you will go to this meeting and you could take potentially take the lead in talking about the, the Marsh Creek issue. Uh, then at 3.30, uh, meeting with assembly member Mia Bonta, uh, that meeting um, director Corbett has indicated she would like to be the lead board member for uh, and we're inter very interested in continuing a conversation with her about our Tidewater Public Access Project. Uh, we have had conversations with her staff and actually I think virtually with her as well in the past and um, the project still needs resources. So we're going to continue to highlight that for her. Uh, and the next meeting, I believe is at four. Oh, and this was another issue why we may have to um, 
separate for some of us. Uh, at four o'clock, we have a meeting with the Department of Finance, which will require a little bit of uh, travel time in terms of walking over there. Uh, but we are looking forward to having a conversation with them, both about our storm damage and then uh, the Conservation Corps uh, ask that uh, they had made to the governor. Uh, so on that on that meeting, um, we will be joined by President Waspy and Director San Wong, and we'll we'll wait to hear from others. Uh, but we're looking forward to having that conversation. Then at 4.30, uh, meeting with Senator Glazer uh, in his office, a former Brad Key Championing Advocacy Award winner. Uh, and I'll let, um, I'll let Lisa speak to the uh, project there at Mar in Martinez. Great. So looking forward to connecting with Senator Glazier. Um, as Eric noticed, he noted he is a former Radke Award, and I also want to highlight in the packet we provided you. Um, on each member section, you'll find strategic engagement notes where we make um, acknowledgments of uh, funding uh, advocated for or other engagement uh, that we've had with each office. So Senator Glazier received the Radke Award for his uh, support in securing uh, $4 million for Del Val's water system and visitor center. Um, but today, or sorry, not today, uh, next week, next Tuesday, uh, we'll be chatting with his office and, and, and Mr. Glazier about the Martinez Bay Trail extension project. Uh, this is a half mile extension project which could connect the Bay Trail to your Martinez Intermodal Center and many other beneficial commuter routes, um, as well as serving as a recreation connection for trail users. Um, while highlighting uh, this project, I also want to note that for these projects, um, Yuli Padmore, Executive Assistant and Flora Chantosh, Legislative Assistant, did collect a variety of letters of support for these projects. So in each office, we will be presenting uh, the member with a formal meeting packet, which has the resource request letter signed by our general manager. It has any letters of support that were collected for that project and some briefing information on admin limit and the conservation work. So just uh, by way of context, when we enter into these meetings, we will be providing each office with a packet, um, including represented support from the community on these projects. And we'll go over all of this again at the briefing on Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning. And uh, for for that meeting, we have um, Director Waspy, President Waspy, Director San Wong, and Director Rosario interested in attending. And I, I I'm guessing that our chair will also want to join in that meeting. One interesting fact about his district uh, that we should share is that in redistricting, uh, he would normally be losing uh, or, or, or moving north uh, in, in the Tri-Valley area of Alameda County would be represented by uh, Susan Tantamales Eggman. Uh, however, because neither one of them were on the ballot in 2022, the constituents in the Tri-Valley uh, did not have an opportunity to vote for Senator Igman. So uh, between the two offices, they have uh, they will be keeping um, the boundaries that they ha currently have. So we will we will be meeting with Senator Glazer as a as a representative of his current district. So that's just a, by way of explaining why uh, a meeting with Susan Eggman is not on the schedule. Uh, at five o'clock, we thought we would for any any board members or, or staff that wanted to have a, a deep brief uh, of the day, uh, we could gather in the hotel lobby and just go through that. Um, if nobody's interested, that's fine too. Uh, we would just ask folks to come back at six uh, so we can start to assemble and get into our transportation to go over to dinner at Hook and Ladder. And that'll be another, um, it's, it's not a formal, uh, it, it's, it's a, less formal type of dinner. Uh, the next morning, uh, we have a little bit of a gap currently, uh, but we are working on uh, a meeting with the governor's staff. And we are, are while well, we are not going to be meeting with Senator Wahab uh, because she's not available these two days in Sacramento, but we are, are trying to arrange a future meeting with her. But if we get the meeting with uh, the governor's office uh, and, and get slotted into this 9.30 to 11.15 uh, window, uh, then we will meet at 9.30 and go to, to that meeting. 
Um, and again, it'll be similar to Department of Finance, share the, the storm damage, uh, talk about our request for the Conservation Corps' request for funding, and um, uh, just a general overall view of the Park District. At 11.15, um, we are slated to arrive at the Department of Natural Resources. They do require a photo ID to enter, so please bring one, and that's the reason we're meeting there 15 minutes early. Um, if we go to the governor's, if we have a meeting with the governor's team, we'll go for probably go from there to the resources building. If we do not, we will change the start time uh, to meet in the lobby in the morning so that we can all uh, get into transportation to go over to resources or, or walk. I'm, I'm not actually sure how far it will be. And, and um, yes, um, I just wanted to flag that on that board members, um, please expect an updated brochure and itinerary by email tomorrow. Um, if more changes come in, we'll continue to update you by email and day of morning of in Sacramento, we will have the most up to date brochure printed and available for you. So just thank you for your understanding that the schedule is continuing to change as we confirm meetings and we will continue to keep you apprised of those changes. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, and then we will be provided a, a guided tour of the building and um, that actually uh, it's a it's a new facility and um, had the opportunity to do a similar type of tour earlier or last year, I guess. And um, it's really quite a quite quite a sight to see. So we will be uh, get, be be provided a tour of it. And then at twelve fifteen, we will meet on their patio, and uh, we will have pre ordered lunches from uh, which all of you hopefully will place your order with. Um, with Yuli Padmore and um, the day of we will be dining on their patio. Uh, I know Dr. Alvarez and Flora Santos have um, both reached out to resources uh, staff or, or uh, deputy directors to, to potentially come down and say hello or join us for lunch. So hopefully we will have some guests while we're while we're there. And then at one o'clock, uh, so we'll probably leave resources a little a little before that, maybe 1245 or so, we have a meeting with assembly member Ortega, a new member to our delegation. Uh, and before um, I'll, I'll turn over to Lisa for um, the project, but uh, for the meeting, uh, Director Corbett has indicated she would like to lead. Uh, Director Waspy, uh, San Wong and Rosario have all indicated they would like to attend. So this currently is one of our larger groups of um, board members meeting with her, but we will also um, probably have to separate uh, with the East County crew uh, because of the time to get over to assembly member of Wilson's office. But um, Lisa, if you would want to speak to the Oyster Bay project. Absolutely. So what's exciting about the Oyster Bay project is um, some may call it a staging areas, but it's also just it's expanding the access of the park. So this is a request for resources to put in um a bike racks an accessible gender inclusive restroom a water bottle filling station and other amenities as well as uh trail connections to the larger features of this park including the uh, frisbee golf course uh, nature walks uh, outdoor art and so we're excited about what this could mean for expanding access to the oyster bay uh, shoreline park um, and if it's all right eric i'm going to go ahead and continue uh, folks uh, who have interest in meeting with our East County representatives, uh, they will be joining um, myself with Assembly Member uh, Lori Wilson. And I do want to note that this meeting will be followed by a quick power walk over to Senator Dodd's office. So we're meeting with Assembly Member Lori Wilson at 1.30, and then we're scheduled to meet with Senator Bill Dodd at 2 p.m. And they do share jurisdiction. And we will be speaking about the same resource request in both of those offices. So just wanted to flag that we're intending to have a leisurely walk between each meeting, but this is one place in the schedule where we will have to um, move a little quicker. Um, in this meeting, we're gonna be discussing opportunity for resources to support uh, outdoor recreation and programming in East Contra Costa County. Uh, because when we think about capital projects, we're also often thinking in large numbers Outdoor programming um, is well supported uh, by hundred of thousand dollars. We uh, opted to combine the various programs occurring in East Contra Costa County um, and put in a holistic resource request. And so the resource request is for supplies, 
materials, uh, support of programming for our adventure crew, our uh, uh, junior ranger program, our internship program, and our community partners programs um, in East Contra Costa County. And the same request will be going uh, with us to our meeting at 2 p.m. with Senator Bill Dodd, who is currently scheduled to join us in this meeting, which is very exciting. Um, we've been often meeting with his legislative director, but at this time, Senator Dodd is confirmed to join the discussion. And uh, we will update this because the second item here should say uh, California Conservation Corps. So that will be one change, but we will, with Senator Dodd, continue our discussion um, on recreation and outdoor programming in East Contra Costa County, as well as the sponsored legislation and uh, the general manager's administrative limit. Will you have those specifics with regard to outdoor rec and ed education uh, for, for uh, board members uh, before we go? I'd like to be familiar with the specific programs um, for those two meetings. Yes, if you if you go into the memo that was provided, we do have briefing material on on this request. Okay, I haven't gone there yet. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, then currently scheduled to be our last meeting of the of the of the whole um, series of meetings uh, is a meeting with Senator Skinner. Uh, it'll be a quick meeting. Uh, she's got fifteen minutes to meet with us. And uh, obviously, a former, another former Radke Award winner and a uh, big champion for the Park District. Uh, we'll be thanking her for all the budget work that she's done on our behalf. Um, and in, in this meeting, uh, I, I do believe the Director Corbett and Director Waspy and Director Rosario will want to attend. Uh, and we will be discussing the Tidewater Project that we mentioned earlier. Uh, as well as thanking her and flagging the CCC and GM authorization limit for her. So that's the uh, two days. Um, we're hoping that that will be our last meeting so we can beat traffic. Uh, as I mentioned, we are trying to have uh, schedule a meeting with the governor. If the only time they could meet, or his office, I should say, if the only time that they can meet is uh, after the Senator Skinner, we would probably take that um, and uh, leave, leave town a little later than anticipated. So with that, we would take any additional questions from the board um, before we move on. So Director San Wong or Director Waspy? Uh, no, I, I I love it. That uh, thanks for all the uh, background work, and I, I really look forward to this. Uh, these meetings are very very effective, and I, I, I there's a lot of new new people that I'd like to meet and, and uh, tell our story to. And I think we this is a great great way to do it. Yes, I'm looking forward to. That. I haven't um, done this before, so this will be a new experience for me, and I I think it'll be a good one. Um, I have some questions um, and a comment. I'll start with my comment. I'm, I'm really excited to take the uh, board lead with the meeting with assembly member Alex Lee. I think it'll be a really good opportunity for me. So thank you so much for considering this. And I know that in terms of our park district, his, his district is mostly, um, you know, Silicon Valley based, but then he has the Southern portion of Fremont. So I think that that's a good uh, match there in terms of me meeting with him. And I have met with him before on Zoom. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure to reference that. Um, in terms of my questions, it's mostly logistics. So I, I understand that we don't have to reserve a hotel room. It's all set up for us. Is that correct? That is uh, correct. I, I believe the, the clerk of the board's office can assist you with any specific questions you have on the hotel. Um, but there is a, a room reserved for each board member. Okay, great. And are is everyone from the board able to attend next week, or is it going to be um, a portion of us? It sounds like most people are able to attend. Yeah, at this time, we do have all seven board members confirmed for attending some portion of this conference in Sacramento. Um, so we're looking forward to engaging with you all. Great. Okay. And and should we should also indicate that. Um, our Deputy General Manager, Ana Alvarez, Dr. Ana Alvarez, and uh, General Manager Sabrina Landreth are currently scheduled to participate as well. Okay, that's 
good to know. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. If I may, Director Coffey? Sure. Yes, uh, both Sabrina and I will be joining as Eric mentioned, and we're really looking forward to spending quality time with all of you. This is an important advocacy effort, and I think that it's really on the relationships that we can continue to build on, and most importantly, our relationships with one another. So uh, both Sabrina and I are really looking forward to spending this quality time with you. Um, and, and I also want to take a moment to, um, to acknowledge the good work of the team, the, legis the staff team here. It's a, it's a lot of coordination, uh, and it's, I'm really looking forward to the day. But in support of the board, uh, the clerk of the board does have a, a function here, and I know that they're diligently working to make sure that all of the board members' needs are met, their logistical needs, which includes the, uh, the opportunity to carpool with one another, and also certainly the arrangements for the overnight stay. And um, hopefully I can have some of my good colleagues from the California Natural Resources Agency join us for lunch because I, I'm really looking forward to all of you getting to know them uh, on a personal level because they're beautiful people. And uh, if, if we can have the time to spend with them, it will be very rewarding. Thank you. I, I have a question, Eric, by way of background. The uh most prominent issue we have among those that we are taking up with our legislators or their staffs is interestingly enough, the general manager, general manager's spending limitation of legislation that we're looking after. And I want to ask by way of background, how far have we taken that issue through our own board, and forgive me if it's in our briefing packet, and I haven't gotten to that yet, but um, has the ledge committee addressed that, that GM authorization limitation and that exists currently, or has the executive committee taken it up for discussion? I, I just need that background. Yeah, it was considered by ledge committee, actually, I think a couple of times, um, and then the board at the January uh, board meeting uh, adopted a resolution in support of it. Uh, that was actually a request by uh, the legislature is to have a, a board adopted a resolution before they drafted the language. So I'm now remembering that was in our consent calendar? Uh, yes, I believe so, yeah. Okay. I want to recommend that we make sure that in pursuing this so prominently that we're not really ahead of our board because I'm not um, all that confident or assured that because it was on the consent calendar that we all understood exactly what was going on here. I, I'm just, I, I think perhaps we wanna take this for at least a discussion with the exec committee so that we know if this legislation passed, it would be incumbent on us to adopt it in our own policies. And I say all of this just as, you know, a, a an effort to make sure our own board is well-educated in this so that it doesn't get to that point and we're not. Um, I personally strongly support this. I think the basis shouldn't be so much on population, but it should be on basis of what a local government um, uh, budget is. And if you look at this historic $50,000 limit applying to park districts, most of them are very small districts, right? They're municipal uh, fundamentally. And we're now a $400 million annual enterprise and um, $50,000 is a ridiculous limit and it should be a couple hundred thousand. And that'll make uh, our board load easier and uh, board preparation easier for these meetings. So I'm in, thoroughly in favor of this and pursuing it as um, vigorously as we are and taking it to every single legislative meeting. Um, but I just want to make sure our own board is fully aware and on board with it as well. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Okay, I appreciate that, Council. Um, next would be Federal Advocacy Week. Yeah, um, I guess I guess it's my role to uh, be the bearer of inconvenient news, but um, uh, the PR advocate um, Umhofer indicated to us um, that the Republican uh, majority now 
has changed the calendar from uh, when we first uh, were scheduling our meetings with our planning to schedule our meetings with electeds in Washington and the week that we had designated to uh, be there, which is normally a very busy period in the middle of March, uh, is has been taken off the table as a district work period and members are not expected to be in Washington. Uh, so we will be canvassing the board and uh, the general manager for another uh, week that could work. Um, so it does not appear, and I saw Peter jumped on, it does not appear that the week of the uh, 13th through 17th uh, would be a good efficient use of our time in terms of meeting with our delegation. But Peter, did you have more to, to add to that? Only that there's there's some other options and we'll make sure to uh, pick the best date that works with everyone's schedules. It's unfortunate, but um, we'll make the best of the situation. Okay. Yeah, we have at least four different potentials that we'll be sending around. So um, maybe maybe we can also have a, a conversation with with uh, at some level um, while we're meeting in, in Sacramento as well. But we will we will get it on the schedule. It just uh, unfortunately was not going to be the date that we had hoped. So I think with that, we don't have a thorough report on the schedule because we don't have one yet. Okay, well, thank you for working on that. And we'll move on to item three, which is local issues, actions taken by other jurisdictions, Brian and Naoma. Good afternoon, Chair Coffey, uh, members of the committee. Um, welcome, uh, committee member San Wong and alternate uh, Mercurio. Um, uh, I'm uh, Brian Holt, Chief of Planning, Trails, and GIS. I'm joined today with our principal planner, Naoma Laval. Um, and just by way of introduction, um, why we are here, one of the functions of the planning department is um, really monitoring and keeping track of a lot of the um, uh, planning programs, projects, and various initiatives that are going on at the at the local level with our um, uh, 35 or however many different cities and jurisdictions that we work with that we partner with in the East Bay. Um, so that's something that we do on a weekly basis. We track the um, track the agendas, receive notices of the various uh, city councils. Uh, board of Supervisors, um, various special districts and others. So um, the standard that we like to say that we hold ourselves is that we like to know everything that's going on in the East Bay all the time. Um, we don't always necessarily achieve that, obviously, but uh, but usually uh, we can know where to find information. So uh, for Commissioner uh, or Committee Member San Long and, and Mercurio, we're um, we're available if you uh, receive questions from constituents about projects of concern that they might be asking what the Park District's position is on it. We um, we are available to do that research and and be able to fill you in. So you're armed with whatever material you need to to be able to. Um, respond to your constituents or if you have questions about different things that are going on in, in your uh, your ward it's always helpful to to hear um, hear often from director coffee and it's a it's a huge help to know what's going on um, going on in the ward and where things are at so um, it takes a village as, as many of these projects are going through so with that I'm going to share my screen and run through just a couple slides um, uh, I will say relatively quiet because we are post uh, Post holidays and in the new year here. Um, are you able to see my screen all right there? Okay, very good. Uh, so the first item, kind of a perennial item, is the um, the redevelopment of the former Concord Naval Weapons Station and the selection of uh, a master developer for um, the city-owned property of the Concord Naval Weapons Station. So um, as you'll recall, the city um, has gone through uh, a couple rounds of trying to select a, a master developer. Um, they did enter into a negotiating agreement with uh, Concord First Partners, which is a, a consortium of uh, Lewis Homes, uh, California Capital Group, uh, and Discovery Builders, uh, a CINO-owned company, um, and uh, looking to come to and develop a term sheet that they can then bring to the Navy to continue negotiations on uh, the disposal of the city-owned property. So as we're all aware, um, we have uh, completed uh, the public benefit conveyance of 
phase one of over of about 2,300 uh, 2,300 acres of, uh, of the future Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50. So that's on the eastern side of, uh, of um, Mar uh, Mount Diablo Creek. Uh, and then the remainder of the property, about 2,500 acres or so, um, is still owned and retained by the Navy, um, is scheduled to go to the city um, and eventually to a developer who um, would be developing um, under the current area plan, it's about 13,000 homes. Uh, under the term sheet, that has been raised to about 16,000 homes. Um, there was a, a marathon meeting about two weeks ago that the council heard from, um, heard uh, the developer's proposal and heard loudly from the community. It was about a nine hour meeting. Um, and, uh, and so the council continued that meeting. So they're going to have their deliberations on that term sheet and presumably, hopefully, uh, make a decision one way or the other on uh, whether they move forward with this master developer or restart the process. Um, and that will be this Saturday. So, um, so if you're looking for something to do on Saturday, um, that should be an interesting meeting. Uh, Second item is uh, we have, our staff has been reviewing um, the environmental impact statement and the proposed project for the state route 239. Uh, so this is a, a, a new, essentially a new highway project that would uh, go from uh, state route four at Marsh Creek Road through Contra Costa County to uh, I-580 over in uh, Alameda County. And obviously we, um, have been acquiring a lot of land within this area. So we have uh, been interested in what that alignment is, uh, if it would uh, impact any of our lands um, and, uh, and what, sort of, um, what sort of other features or, um, or mitigation that that project might have that, that might relate to what we do. So um, it's in the environmental review phase. Obviously there's a lot of community interest in uh, developing a, a new highway um, through this area. Um, we've been working closely with the East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy uh, in our review of this to, to see where we're at and, um, and have been meeting with, uh, uh, have been in meetings with all of the various state agencies um, and others to sort of understand this proposal. So this has been around for a while. It used to be referred to as the Trilink project um, and, uh, and just, uh, just recently has received some funding. So, so it's moving forward into the environmental review phase. Um, and then just the last item I will highlight, also a, a big project that's been around for a long time, uh, the De Delta Conveyance Project. So the EIS, Environmental Impact Statement from the Army Corps of Engineers, um, that's been issued, uh, an e a state level EIR was issued uh, earlier uh, at the latter part of last year that, uh, that we'd also reviewed. This is what has been referred to as the the Delta Tunnels Project, the Delta Conveyance Project. Um, one thing for us, um, uh, obviously there's also a lot of interest in this in East Contra Costa County um, and throughout the Delta area, um, but for the Park District directly, the, the current alignments um, uh, with the exception of where it ties um, right into the uh, Bethany Reservoir, um, largely bypasses uh, the district's jurisdiction and, and pretty much keeps the alignments within um, San Joaquin County. So whereas before we had seen proposals that uh, proposed tunnels going through some of our lands or areas that we had an acquisition interest, um, this one largely does it. But again, we're keeping a close eye on this one. It's regionally important, it's statewide important. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but also um, uh, we, we're looking at this sort of in the vein of what mitigation uh, might proposals might come out of this. Um, of course, we're also looking at the Los Vaqueros Reservoir Expansion Project, which um, ties that into the state water project and all these things are kind of connected. So um, we're continuing to try to keep our arms around this and trying to understand where we're at. So with that, I think that's the, the end of my slides. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and, uh, and again, um, uh, welcome any, uh, any input on, uh, on future items that you'd like to hear from there in the region. Hmm. Well, Director Samuel, any questions or comments, suggestions? Yes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Delta Conveyance and Los Vaqueros. Um, in many ways, I'd say where I live in the Tri-Valley region, 
portion of Alameda County, Livermore, Dublin, Pleasanton, uh, serviced by Zone 7, which is the previous board of directors I was on. You know, we consider ourselves really the first stop of the state water project. So the Delta Conveyance Project, as well as the Los Vaqueros expansion, are really big projects that Zone 7 has been involved in over, you know, the past four and a half years that I was on the board of Zone 7. So certainly projects that I'm very, very familiar with, and also from a perspective as a state water project contractor. And so certainly if there's any way that I can help, you know, kind of give that perspective, um, I, I want to make sure that I make myself available. And then also knowing that downstream from the Zone 7 service area is Alameda County Water District, which Ward 5 also includes Fremont and Newark. And then I know uh, Director Waspy uh, has Union City, and that's also part of Alameda County Water District. And so they are also on the South Bay Aqueduct. Um, and there are some implications also in Del Val, right, is the main reservoir for the state water project. And, um, and, and so while, you know, directly the Delta Conveyance Project and thinking about the tunnel would impact uh, land use in Contra Costa County, I think in terms of water, there are implications for other parts of the park district and um, Del Val specifically in terms of a reservoir. So I, I just want to state that as we um, look at these uh, two uh, projects specifically. And then I, I do have a question also about the EIR for the Delta Conveyance Project. Are we submitting any comments or is this mostly a project that we're keeping an eye on and don't really have comments to submit since most of it's in San Joaquin County, it looks like? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we we have taken a look at it. We've reviewed it. We We have not. Um, we have not provided comments on this round of environmental review, and I don't um, intend to, um, unless I hear unless I hear otherwise. Um, so uh, uh, we have. I will share though, and I appreciate your comments on Zone Seven's interest and just kind of how obviously all this water is, is very complicated. Um, with the Los Vaqueros Reservoir expansion and with this project, um, we have submitted comments previously on uh, the Los Vaqueros Reservoir expansion and the the Bethany. Um, uh, canal, the intertie project, um, really along the lines of, uh, as you may be familiar, a lot of the mitigation and public benefit investment from that project is um, going to the Central Valley for for wetland uh, restoration um, elsewhere within that that service area, and and we've just um, have advocated, and as you touched on, um, the district owns and manages state facilities uh, in the East Bay, um, and uh, and advocating for some of that mitigation and. Public Public benefit investment um, to come back to the East Bay, where um, uh, to uh, to either address some of the deferred maintenance at Del Val, uh, make Bethany Reservoir more accessible uh, and perhaps pleasant um, to to those folks who are actually where the population is here in the East Bay. In addition to the the important restoration work that's going to be done elsewhere in the Delta. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, any thoughts? Well, no, other than that, I, I, I sure appreciate these updates and I'm sure glad we, we uh, incorporated this local local reporting back to us uh, last year. It's, it's been great and informative. I, I'm, I'm wondering, so when Concord goes through their um, um, negotiations or whatever, gyrations, whatever we keep calling them, uh, do we have park district people there and, and including National Park Service people there? Are we re-advocating? I mean, we've got a great project that's coming, a great collaboration between two great agencies, and it seems like we're going to sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait. Uh, well, I will say, um, if I, I will address the last part of your comments first, is that's why we are in our government affairs team uh, and legislative affairs team have been successful in getting us funds to move forward with the phase one public access project at Thurgood Marshall. So that south of Bailey Road area where we are in design and working on opening that up, we recognize that that's a separate and distinct portion of the property that's not going to be impacted um, or influenced really in any way by the city's development project. So, so we wanted to be able to bring something online. So 
we didn't necessarily have to wait and wait forever. We could provide something to the citizens of Concord in the near term. Um, so that is why we identified that area as phase one. Um, the, the other part of your question is, I do have a really good working relationship with the city of Concord. Um, frankly, I have a good relationship with the, the Concord First uh, Partners team too. Um, I have met with them a number of times and reviewed their term sheet um, and have provided them my wish list of what we want to see in there. So sort of agnostic of whoever becomes the developer, we have certain things that we wanna see there. We wanna see the extension of utilities into our property. We want to see um, some coordination on the development of uh, the city sports park, city parks um, and our facilities. Um, we wanna see the closure of the Contra Costa Canal to Delta De Anza Trail, um, closure of that gap um, early in the phase. So, so we provided this to them early on and again, agnostic of whoever becomes the master developer, that that's something that we want to see in whatever project moves forward. So um, so we have participated in, in the background and trying to help them as they develop the term sheet. Um, and we have also, we do, I've definitely been monitoring the meetings and sort of watching where it's at. But um, at this point, this is really a, it's a decision for the city. It's a tough decision for the city. And um, so it will, it'll be interesting to see where they go. Well, great. I appreciate that you're there at the table, though. Brian, on, on that note, did city staff recommend approval of this latest term sheet? Um, I, I, I believe so. I believe the recommendation was to approve the term sheet, correct? Um, yes. I've read the news articles and try to keep current on it, but that one kind of slipped through. I wasn't sure whether Guy Berkey affirmatively recommended it or whether um, that was part of it. So I'm, I'm quite confident that it was a recommendation for approval. Yeah. I will go back and double check that, but um, I know Guy had worked very closely with them to, to bring something forward for a recommendation. Yeah, and they want to get it moving forward. I think there's a very good chance that uh, they will re reject this term sheet and <clears throat> maybe look to the firm that uh, placed second last time, but I'm, I'm not sure of that. I just got a sense that, that could happen, uh, which will put them a bit further behind. But I, I think as long as we have our hands on and uh, focus on what needs to be done with anybody who develops those properties, we're in good shape because we're moving forward at least with that first phase. And uh, if worse comes to worse, there probably could be a second phase with that, that's some, someplace independent of the city's land. Um, in any event, um, I also wanted to ask, maybe Eric would, would call Brian, you might recall, did, has the park district ever formally taken a position on the conveyance system since the tunnels first, first, uh, 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 the, the first concept of using tunnels instead of a canal came about? Yeah, um, we did take a position when um, Director Radke was um, chairing this committee. I don't remember the year, but it was maybe maybe 10 years ago by now. Yeah, yeah I, had the, the, I had the understanding that the district formally opposed the concept. Um, of course, it's shifted from two large tunnels down to a single tunnel. Um, but you know, my impression is the same coalition of you know of Delta farming interests, uh, environmental interests, and I know my constituencies in East Contra Costa all still oppose uh, the conveyance on the on the fundamental view that uh, you do not, uh, for, for the sake of the Delta, we do not want to enhance the ability to divert. Um, more water volume from the Delta down to the Central Valley and Southlands. So I, you know, it's been my personal position and I have when sought after I expressed opposition to the, the, the new plan as it, as it were. And uh, I understand are just keeping a close eye on what's happening. Um, with that, unless there are any other questions or comments on this issue, Thank you, Brian. And I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I see Dr. Ana Alvarez had her hand up. Yeah. I didn't see her hand on. Oh, okay. that's okay. But thank you so much. I just have a question for staff, and I, and I apologize I, uh, if I'm taking you by surprise. But I, I wanted to understand if you could give me a little bit of background. And I know 
uh, Director Waspy may have been following this or, or is following this. Is paid mud trucking uh, fill into the quarry or away from the quarry at Lake Chabot? Um, yeah. I, I had the pleasure of, work, of going out to do a presentation on 30 by 30 with the Friends of San Leandro Creek and got an earful <laughs> on that. Um, that is a project that we've been tracking. Uh, we have met with East Bay Mud staff, um, and uh, it is a site, an old quarry site that um, East Bay Mud is looking to um, uh, rec reclaim. Um, and so they've reached out to the park district as a potential future landowner of that site and sort of to ask what our interests in the site might be. Um, but yes, I, I gather there's, uh, which we haven't made any commitments to in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, but there's, I know there's community concern just around the, the truck trips and those types of things, um, which is, I would say, you know, um, an issue for East Bay Mud to, to resolve with the community is we, we don't necessarily have a direct role in that right now. Thanks. But I'd be happy to share more information with you. And we have we have a full file on that one. As well. Thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, by the way, there's a lot of people that say hello to you. And I'll share the names later. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> I'd love to hear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very man. much. Appreciate being here. Thank you, Brian. Always one of my favorite topics for education. Um, item four, funding and grants updates with Jeff and Katie. Katie, you're on mute. Sorry. There you um, are. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Katie Hornbeck, Grants Manager. Nice to meet everyone. Um, and Happy New Year. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my report. So just as some some context, um, so uh, at, the, at these uh, committee meetings, what I'm basically presenting is uh, Award or grant awards that we've received um, since the last time I presented, as well as grant applications we've we've submitted, um, and then also just happy to answer any any questions or discuss any particular questions you have about about the grants. Um, so for today's presentation, it's a little light because uh, it's covering really the the last two months of the year, and that tends to be a little a little. Um, sparse um, as things are kind of winding down in the holidays. So we did a, a submit a few applications. Um, uh, three three applications. Um, I'll highlight the first two. Uh, these are uh, pre-applications, uh, one to the Wildlife Conservation Board and one to the Coastal Conservancy. So um, as some of you are probably familiar, uh, both agencies uh, changed their process uh, in 2022 where they were no longer going to be doing um, solicitations for specific grant programs that if you had a project you would submit a pre-application um, just as like a, um, just very generally. And then they would come back and say, yes, we're interested in this project or it's eligible um, and it's eligible for um, X pot of money. So it's a, for public access or for fish, fish passage or Prop 68, some, something else. So they will decide from that point how to, how to divvy out the funds and invite us to, to submit a full application. So. Um, so that's that's a little bit of the, the background there. So you'll see uh, pre-applications on this list uh, pretty frequently. Um, and in the next like two months, we're gonna be submitting at least another dozen. Um, so that's, that's grants applied. And then for grants awarded, um, uh, I would actually probably defer to Eric or Lisa if they wanted to give some um, additional background on both of these. These were um, uh, uh, requests through the, through the government affairs team. Um, and those were recently uh, awarded to us. So when that happens, um, uh, my I step in, and uh, and once an agency has been assigned to funnel the the funds, then I work with them to get the grant agreement and to 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 work out work out the de details. So um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and uh, happy, happy to answer any questions. I think those numbers are reversed, Katie, on the. Uh... Mm -hmm. Grants awarded. I think fire mitigation was 1.5, and the visitor center planning was three. So okay, I, I will. I'll double. I'll double check, and if it needs to be corrected, I'll. I'll send that over to Flora and and the, the board members. Um, no questions from from me, directors. No questions, but thank you. It's good to know this information, and it's really um, yeah, it is nice to see. 
Yeah, I guess my only comment would be, I guess, uh, wildfire mitigation has become really, really popular. I, I noticed that the, um, oh, what is it, the Coastal Conservancy gave $2 million to Alameda County Fire to form a, a fuels crew just like ours, and Confire did it last year. So it seems like everybody's jumping on board. That's a really successful program and, and, and does a great amount of good. Yes, definitely. And fortunate for us too, we have we have a lot of work that we want to get funded too. So uh, we were in constant communication with Coastal, Coastal Conservancy for, for projects that are ready for money. So um, one of the pre-applications we submitted last year was for some fuels work out at the Tilden Nature area. And um, a few weeks ago, we were invited to submit the full application. So um, we'll be we'll be getting that in here pretty shortly. So. Thank All you right. very much. Katie, congratu congratulations to you and uh, the rest of the team on a really fantastic year last year in terms of uh, grants made. I think it was a record year. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely a team, team effort. Thank you. Um, Chair, Chair Coffey, uh, yes. if, if you don't mind, I, I know Lisa had jumped on. Uh, it might be beneficial for the board to um, understand the community uh, project benefit or community benefit project asks and how that works because it's um, it's more involved than than the old earmarks of 20 years ago um, and I know Peter will probably talk about their future prospects but I just thought it might be worth uh, at least explaining a little bit of how how we got those and uh, what 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 is required of us to even make the ask yeah certainly thank you Lisa Happy to. Um, so this year we were successful with two of our community project funding requests. I will share, we did submit a request for each member of our delegation based off of the priorities that the board identified for those members. Uh, the process is a little bit more in depth than just uh, picking up the phone and making a request elected to elected. It is now a application process for the, the various priorities um, in which the member guided by the ethics committee, um, they each have their own application. And so we did tailor to that specific member's interests. Um, some had more questions about community, others more about the process or the history of that funding. Uh, the two that we were successful with, um, one was uh, with Representative DeSaulnier, who's a, a strong partner of the Park District. And um, this was a, a multi-year request. Eric and Peter worked very hard with the Saulnier's office um, to identify the need for funding. Um, and Peter really deeply explored where funding might be possible. Um, and ultimately it was determined uh, that a HUD grant through community project funding would be possible. And so we were excited um, to work with his legislative director, Sarah and others in moving forward a formal application for that request um, for the preliminary planning design and utilities out at the site. Uh, with uh, Senator Padilla's office, uh, we advanced an application for 1.5 for wildfire mitigation through FEMA funding. And then just by way of like one more layer of additional context for these uh, community project funding requests, we can't, unlike the state funding, which is incredibly flexible um, and responsive, and it's really the end language in the legislative bill that puts that criteria on what we're asking for. For these federal fundings, we have to link it up with existing federal funding programs. And so the request of Senator PDA's office was from for FEMA funding through their BRIC program. Um, we went through a series of back and forth with our offices. We worked with Cal OES to determine that we were eligible for these funds. And that's ultimately how we were able to receive them. So it is a little bit more back and forth than just uh, a one point of, of contact, um, but it's a great opportunity. Um, and we we're really pleased to have two of, I believe the 10 we moved forward last year come to fruition. Um, and it's really exciting uh, that they're, they're going to the visit center into wildfire. So, and in this coming year, we are moving forward a, a few less. Um, we will be hopefully advancing a Martinez Bay Trail request, a Marsh Creek Trail request, um, as well as another wildfire request because as Katie said there is great need um and I, I believe I believe that's that's all so we're looking forward to it and happy to answer any questions thank you any follow-up on Lisa's comments Dennis? Uh, ju ju just at adding that um uh, the reason um not quite sure what the pro best way of saying this is, but each uh, member and each senator gets sort of an allocation of, of asks. 
Um, and so naturally they do try to incorporate as many of their uh, requests as they can. So there is sort of a, an unwritten cap on the dollar amount. And so obviously we could use much more funding for both uh, the visitor center and for wildfire, but um, there are limits to how much uh, each organization can can benefit from um, in terms of their overall amount of asks. So just to note that, that that's um, why the dollar amounts are what they are. Okay. I would add that I agree that the um, regional trails are immensely popular and that if a representative wants to one, assist the park district and two, assist the park district with a project that will be immensely popular, which is kind of a natural thing for them, um, that the, uh, the, the Bay Trail project, the Iron Horse project and the Marsh Creek project are all um, projects that should be um, you know, favorably looked to in terms of checking all the boxes, especially the Bay Trail, the Point Pinole to Pinole, uh, Point, Pinole to Point Wilson Gap uh, should really be something that the uh, administration, Department of Transportation would look favorably upon. And with regard to those segments of the regional trails that are in uh, Congressman Garamendi's new district, we know that he's very eager to um, champion a uh, funding cause for us. He's expressed that to me on numerous occasions and goes out of his way to do it. It's, it's, it's uh, almost embarrassing at times. He's very aggressive and I love that. And it's a really uh, interesting stance he has with regard to park district uh, projects. And uh, if we can um, get the, the congressman involved uh, in these projects. And we've talked about site visits, Eric. I, I just want to continue to encourage us working with uh, our, our new congressional representative because of his personal eagerness to partner with us on funding causes. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I will, um, if, if I may add, uh, we are giving a little bit of a preview of what would have been our federal advocacy presentation. In addition to these direct requests for member funding and partnership, um, we do plan to speak with our delegation when we get to DC about our raise application. Um, and I'm sure Katie would be happy to answer any questions the board may have on the rebuilding, rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity. Um, we're moving five projects uh, hopefully forward in that package based off of feedback we received from Department of Transportation from our 2021 application. Thank you for clarifying that. You know, I was moving beyond the uh, community benefit asks. I was, you know, there's a panoply of programs under this administration that active transportation can benefit from. Um, so that's the context I put uh, uh, Congressman Garamendi's interest in uh, pursuing for us and helping us. All right, can we move to federal advocate briefing? And welcome, uh, Peter. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. I'll start by talking about the FEMA process, Federal Emergency Management Agency. And I know that all of us are familiar with their work and the relationship with the Park District, but I thought I'd just run through the situation as it is right now and the floods that have occurred and the damage assessments that are ongoing. The president made presidential designations to several different counties, Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Sacramento, and Merced. Contra Costa and Alameda were not part of that designation. That's not to say that they won't be, but it's gonna take probably the congressional delegation to weigh in, assuming the damages get so high, and I assume they will be, after those damage assessments. So um, I flag that for all of you to the extent, as soon as there are updated numbers, we're gonna need to start communicating with the delegation, um, but you also may be talking with the state and with your count county colleagues too about their damage assessments. I'd be really surprised, but I defer to you that Contra Costa County and Alameda aren't gonna make a push to be part of this designation. Um, but it may take some advocacy um, to, do th to do that. So preliminary damage assessments are being done, new information is being provided to the state. And um, again, 
counties are sometimes added after the first designations are made. Right now, the Park District is making those damage assessments and collecting data that will inform then FEMA, that then the Park District would be able to apply, assuming that the county is designated, the counties are designated to the public assistance funding. There's been some changes and there's some ongoing changes happening in the public assistance funding, which I think will be beneficial to the park district. And I would just suggest that the park district weigh in on your concerns that you've had in the past, which is, look, we want to make things resilient and strong for the future. We don't want to put up the same thing again and have it torn down or flooded out. Um, the that FEMA is finally getting that message and FEMA is making changes, but I think they need to be pushed some more. And so there's a public comment period literally happening right now with FEMA on that public assistance funding. Um, and that goes until February 13th. So it's an opportunity just to literally show two or three examples of here's what we wanna do, here's what was destroyed, here's what we want to do going forward. They are trying, though, to be creative on this in this vein of using "quote unquote" cost-effective measures that do not exceed 100% of eligible cost repair. Meaning, <laughs> in simple speak, this is um, we'll work with you and try and find meet you more than halfway um, in um, trying to repair something better than it was before. Um, which I think is smart in this era that Dr. Alvarez was talking about, which is we're dealing with climate on a daily basis. Um, so I, I just, I suggest that letter before the 13th, I think it would be helpful. Um, so FEMA is also trying to work on reducing these burden hours, they call them, and information collection and removing barriers and having a simpler process for this public assistance. Again, I think they're getting better. I think the region and the park district have improved in terms of their collaboration and their communication. I think it's gotten better um, each year. But again, I defer to Katie and others how they view it at the moment. Um, again, disaster funds tend to cover 100%. There are other FEMA grants that are 75-25, so there's a cost share depending on the program that we're talking about in FEMA. Um, you may remember in 2017, the storms, um, there were there was some FEMA funding that took a while um, for the Park District to get that. Again, I think it's gotten better, um, but I, for Katie and others who want to want to talk about that some more. Um, overall, I would say this may be a, an area that we want to visit not only with the region but with FEMA and DC to talk with them about your own personal experiences um, and what your challenges are as it relates to recovery from this flooding um, when, when we're in Washington. So um, I'll shift, I'm happy to answer questions on FEMA if we wanna talk about that now or I can go to the 118th Congress and what is happening there if that's okay. Yes, Director. Hi, it's nice to meet you, by the way. Um, nice to meet you as well. So much for joining us. I have a few questions. Um, in regards to flood control, well, this might be a question for my uh, Contra Costa County colleagues or those with knowledge of Contra Costa County. Is flood control in Contra Costa County handled by the county or do you have your own flood control agencies within Contra Costa County? They're a department within the county government. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, so my question about this, I, I noticed I, I was listening to President Biden when he was here in California to talk about this, and he did reference one of his taglines, we're going to build back better. And so, you know, hearing you describe the public comment period for FEMA, um, you know, it makes me think about that quote from President Biden, build back better. So when we write a letter, and I would encourage us to do so, um, Maybe we may want to look back at that speech here in California that President Biden made to mention that because it made me think about the conversation we had at our board meeting a week ago when we talked about culverts as an example and how in the past with the FEMA uh, funding, 
we would have to build the culvert back to how it had been before, but maybe that's not what works best given um, how things have changed in regards to climate and you know the situation of these storms. And so in terms of building back better, it might make more sense to increase the size of the culvert, for example. Um, and so I, I wanted to share that comment because I think that might be helpful during this public comment period. I think it's an excellent point and just literally pulling that quote and putting it in the letter um, and then talking about the park district needs or challenges, um, I think would be a very good idea. And then the other question I have more for the park district, but on this same topic is do, do we engage with the counties in regards to flood control? And then my other point, I know I keep on talking about zone seven, but zone seven is the flood control agency uh, just within the Tri-Valley region. Um, and so it might be this unique agency, but certainly it also then gives me some familiarity in terms of uh, flood control planning. And so it's it's timely in regards to our um, present situation. Uh, so I don't know if we do coordinate in, in, in regards to this, but um, I, I know, and I guess we're talking more about the federal government right now, but I, I do know also DWR, um, Department of Water Resources here in at the state level uh, does have a flood grant uh, program, which, you know, the previous uh, agenda item, I was thinking about that um, aspect of things, but I, I think that there might be some other opportunities in terms of projects along these lines. And, and, I, and I have some ideas there, but I'll, I'll wait to share those at another point in time. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the 118th. Yes. Uh, some of you may have watched the beginning of the new Congress and the House of Representatives. It took 14 or 15 votes to decide on a, a speaker. Um, is that a sign or is that not? There's a lot of agenda items and a lot of uh, beginning, a lot of activity happening always at the beginning of a Congress. Um, I'll leave that as an open question. I do have concerns, but I also remain hopeful that there'll be some, um, some ongoing legislation, legislating that will occur in a bipartisan fashion. Um, there may be more activity that happens in the Senate than in the House, um, or the House passes things, but then the Senate decides what it wants to ultimately try and consider and send back to the House or send to the president that has bipartisan agreement. I think it's too early to tell at this point um, it, exactly um, what the mood and appetite is, but it's a little bit of an ominous, ominous start, uh, having watched this for a while now, um, that there is a small group that seems to want to drive uh, the agenda. The House and Senate are just getting their, uh, deciding on their committees and committee membership. And so there's not, I'm not seeing a lot of changes at the moment as it relates to the delegation um, and members going on or going, uh, leaving certain committees and moving to other committees. Um, for example, California senators remain on the same, their same committees that they've, that they've served on. Um, Hearings will start soon. The president will give a State of the Union address on February 7th. There will be a, what is the fiscal year 2024, federal budget will be released uh, towards the end of February. Um, that will then really accelerate the level of activity in legislating because then the budget will need to be passed and then the appropriations bills that fund all those agencies will need to be um, done in that March, April, May, June timeframe. Also in that June timeframe is something you probably have heard about, which is the debt ceiling or the debt limit that needs to be increased by the end of June. There's already a lot of talk you've seen from the president, from leaders in Congress about um, changes that need to be made to, to you know, domestic funding programs in order to raise Republicans are linking the two together, raise the debt ceiling, and that we have to make cuts in domestic programs. There's been statements made that Medicare and Social Security are off the table, but that means that programs that we, that the Park District cares about, 
could be on the chopping block. Um, funding that's in, that was in the Inflation Reduction Act or in the infrastructure bill could be clawed back. Um, I sure hope that's not the case, but um, there's gonna have to be some advocacy. If you remember back to 2011, the last time there was really a debt limit crisis, and it was a period of about eight weeks where um, there was negotiations happening with the White House and with the Congress, and U.S. credit rating was downgraded for the first time in our history. I'm concerned that that could happen again. Um, and I think it's reasonable. I think a lot of people are concerned about that. Um, it just, just to paint a little bit more of a picture, just to try and help you understand, I don't want to get into too much detail, but just paint this picture. Interest rates go up, stock market goes down, the economy spirals into a recession, shaking consumer confidence, um, financial credibility on the world stage is, um, is calling the question, ripples across the globe, promoting debt crunches in lower income countries, foreign currency reserves are suddenly weaker, or held in a suddenly weaker U.S. dollar. Moody's Analytics has said this would double unemployment and could wipe out $12 trillion in household wealth. There's just some people that are happy to have that happen, unfortunately. Um, and, but I think and I hope that cooler heads prevail. But um, right now, it's the beginning of this conversation. Um, again, as you remember, back in 2011, it started kind of the beginning of the year, but really didn't heat up until May. But that May to July it was two days before um, the U.S. was going to hit that debt ceiling is when an agreement was reached. Um, I wouldn't doubt that it is a similar, hopefully cooler heads prevail. Last thing I'll mention is that uh, community project funding, which we talked about before. Um, as of right now, the rules are set in the House that a member of Congress can offer an amendment to strike a project um, when a bill is considered by the full House. It is still to be determined if the in, in the committees themselves, they'll be able to, they won't allow this anymore, um, meaning they won't allow community project funding, or that um, members will be able to offer amendments to strike each other's projects. Um, it's to be determined um, at this point. I'm not sure which way it's gonna go. Um, so again, there's a lot of work and a lot of success in legislative activity that occurred in the last couple of years. Tremendous amount um, has been achieved. You will probably see the administration focused a lot on regulations and regulatory measures and a little bit less legislating this year. I'll stop there and happy to answer questions. Uh, I have a quick one, Peter, and that is at times we speak of a government shutdown and at times we speak of an actual default on the federal debt. Yes. In what context do we talk about those two things? Because a government shutdown seems a lot more benign, as awful as it is, than, right. a, than a default. Great question. So just to review, a government shutdown is when um, a funding isn't provided um, to the federal agency. So they haven't, the, the Congress hasn't passed its appropriations bills for the year. That fiscal year ends on September 30th. So we have until then. Um, the debt ceiling though, Again, the Treasury is already starting to take extraordinary measures now as of last week and says by the end of June or sometime in June, um, there will need to be an action taken by Congress to raise the debt ceiling. So that's where um, certain members in the House are using that as an opportunity to say, we'll vote for it, but we want some domestic program cuts um, and we want some cuts in, you know, certain programs that um, we don't believe are, are useful. So that's that's what's happening in the June timeframe and the September timeframe. Understood. Yep. 
directors? Nothing. No. Okay. Other matters, Peter? No other matters to discuss at this point and look forward to working with everyone this year. Okay. Thank you. May we move on to state advocate briefing? It appears so, Doug. Hey, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure meeting the new directors, Doug Houston, state advocate. And in your packet, you'll see that your GR team did a really nice comprehensive distillation of um, key areas of the budget that are worth consideration as this new budget year evolves. But let me just start by saying it. Um, sort of the best of times, worst of times scenario we find ourselves here in Sacramento. Roughly six months ago, lawmakers adopted budget or a spending plan for the upcoming year, fiscal year, that's largely predicated on 50 plus billion dollars in a surplus. However, soon after the ink began to dry on the governor's signature on that budget, we're being getting to see um, very ominous revenue figures that began to creep into the state's uh, fiscal narrative. And that was corroborated late November and December by the Legislative Analyst Office, su who suggested that we would be, we're, we're running headlong into a, a deficit and they projected the deficit to be about $25 billion. The governor's January budget instead uh, reflects a little bit rosier picture at $22.4 billion. Um, in trying to bridge that gap, um, sadly, the governor's identified roughly about $6 billion in reductions and cuts uh, made to his climate package, his $54 billion climate package to be spent out over the course of the next five years. Um, most of those cuts are more in the energy and transportation sectors, and actually they're looking to offset some of those cuts through what's called greenhouse gas reduction funds. But resource-related expenditures, climate-related expenditures certainly are going to be exacting a toll under the current scenario, so be looking for that. Again, last year, much of the budget's architecture was structured to avoid what's called the GAN limit. I think we've had this conversation, the GAN limit basically states that the state cannot exceed a 2% increase in spending to its baseline budget. So in order to avoid that, in as much as we had such a huge surplus, there's a few things, um, activities that the state can undertake. One is to, uh, in the form of taxpayer rebates, the other one is um, more robust investment in schools. And then lastly, it's, it's one-time investments. And uh, in this budget, there was a bit of a new wrinkle. Haven't seen it in years past. In that, in order to find ways to spend this money, they started spending it in out-year budgets. And that was particularly true as it relates to climate-related investments. So sadly, this budget's reflective of the state and in its electeds, it's they're going to have to face some really difficult challenges, hard decisions. And, and I'm hoping that when the dust settles, some of those commitments that were made in the climate front and the backsliding of those commitments will be favorably resolved. Again, referring to your, uh, your package, some of the more significant reductions for the park district's purposes include nearly a half a billion dollars to state coastal conservancy, 194 billion from Wildlife Conservation Board, although I should uh, preface that by saying that a lot of that spending is coming more out of the, uh, the High Sierra and then uh, Southern California. 100 plus million in what's called the statewide park program, um, 150 million dollar or reduction in the active transportation program. And what's particularly painful for me and in in some of the work that we did last year um, in proposing $35 million for the Rec Trails program, that would have been the largest single investment in the natural surface uh, recreation specific trails. The governor's proposing to cut that as well. So, um, your members' requests that were made last year, safe and protected, uh, given the budget, um, 
scenario I just described, I'd say that the prospect for new member requests are a little bleak. There are some reasons for optimism. Um, some of these cuts that I described are subject to what's called a trigger restoration. Haven't seen anything like this. But come January, if the Department of Finance identifies that our revenues are stronger and more robust than projected at this time, that some of these cuts could be restored. And then also in your um, the summary that uh, your GR team provided, the governor is trying to balance this budget without, without tapping any of the $36 billion in revenues and the surplus, I'm sorry. So, and, and another reason for optimism, and if it's okay, Director Coffey, I just I transition into uh, a bond discussion. Um, next item is that uh, in transitioning to that, lawmakers, to assuage folks in this space, lawmakers and stakeholders alike, the governor broached the topic of a possible resources bond and sponsoring or working with the legislature for a resources bond uh, in the coming year, presumably to backfill <clears throat> some of these losses. However, based on some of the conversations I had with resources agency and lawmakers, they want to go beyond that. And they're actually looking at bonds in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 billion. On the assembly side, uh, similar to activities in the past around 218, I've been recruited to work with Assemblymember Garcia in advancing something working on some language, additive language to what he put forward last year in AB 2387. And it's been represented to me that, again, they wanna exceed the $10, $10 billion in aggregate investment. And some of those investments will include 2 billion in coastal protections, 2 billion in fish and wildlife protections, 2 billion for climate, and over $3 billion for flood and um, stormwater purposes. It's my understanding that there may be a separate bond introduced on flood by a couple of members from the Central Valley. So we'll have to stay tuned. But um, the bond that I just described through Assembly Member Garcia will include a per capita element. And it'll be very uh, public facing in terms of investing in equity and park equity. Um, as you're aware, a lot of the previous bonds and activity around what's called the statewide park program, the park district hasn't been terribly successful in securing those funds based on some of the qualifying criteria. Um, moving forward, I have broached this with Assemblymember Garcia. There seems to be some interest in changing some of these qualifying criteria to ensure that other areas of the state can compete going forward. Again, in the bond, there's also gonna be a lot of money through WCP, State Coastal Conservancy, and importantly, probably 200 plus million dollars for the Bay Area program. So I can stop there and if there are any questions, happy to answer those. Director Waspy. Yeah, thanks for your report, Doug. I, I um, throughout all of this, is there ever, or is there discussion at your level? I hear it, it all the time about water storage, uh, and now that we have tons of water, uh, I mean, when we have a drought, we don't have enough storage. We've got um, so much rain; it's just being wasted, supposedly. Uh, and, and what I'm concerned with, obviously, is the rumors I keep hearing about Lake Del Val and the proposals to raise it six feet, which would pretty much put us all underwater, our whole, every piece of infrastructure, 95% of it. Are there discussions at that level, or, or is it just all proposals from local water agencies, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word? Maybe I should defer to uh, Director San Wong on this topic. <laughs> but um, this is what I will say. <clears throat> we had a proposition back in 2014. It was sponsored by, uh, he wasn't quite speaker yet. That was Anthony Rendon. Uh, there was $3 billion contained in that bond. It was proposition one directly for storage. Um, they have made those allocations 
the most significant of those allocations is for Sites Reservoir, which is uh, near the town of Maxwell, um, along I-5, <clears throat> just north of Sacramento. Um, state has made its commitment to storage relative to sites. The, the holdup, and I get, it's my understanding, Dennis, that they're gonna be breaking ground on that soon, but the holdup has been the state uh, water contractors and their portion of trying to identify the costs for build out, which it's my understanding is probably in the three plus billion dollar range. Is there conversations around this in the context of this bond? <clears throat> not, not yet. I um, and I and I don't know. I I don't know if there will be um, heightened conversations around it. I I know there are bills that have been introduced by Republicans, Central Valley types, to try to identify ways to underwrite more uh, more storage through a set aside of our general fund. There may be a bond. Um, again, I don't, I don't think we'll be seeing that coming out of the Democratic camp. Um, but, you know, uh, we've had, we, we have a lot of water. Um, I'm not sure about Del Val. I think there'll be pretty significant objections to doing something. And, and, and frankly, I don't know in raising Del Val by six feet how much new uh, acre feet you're going to be generating it can't can't be all that significant but i, I don't know if i answered your question yeah, not yeah, my wheel not my wheelhouse <laughs> thanks well no I, I i hear so much about it and i was wondering if there was any talk in the capital and, and uh, I'm... primarily in the in republican quarters okay. for sure i i will be having upcoming conversations i've been uh, briefing specific members of the legislature on on the history of bonds and and what what the current or what the proposed architecture might look like really going forward, and so far I'm not I'm not hearing much around storage. So no fingers crossed. Um, and a, a, a another topic on the agenda: thirty by thirty and outdoors for all. Um, I think things have generally been placed on pause. It's it's pretty quiet in Sacramento. I think due in large part to a lot of the priorities um, have, have pivoted because of the budget and maybe lack of funding going forward. But as I mentioned last month, under uh, under Secretary Jennifer Norris, right now what they're doing is, is working a very group to sort of focus their energies on refining some of the, the gap analysis tools. So what does that mean? It's, it's identifying those lands, those parcels, those landscapes that are currently within the protected land inventory within their database, and then extracting other lands that might be there so that they have a, a good foundational um, baseline of data before before they really truly launch moving forward and into some of the, the the overarching objectives around 30 by 30. For outdoors for all, again, it's pretty quiet. The budget did include another $25 million for outdoor equity grants. Um, these have been wildly popular, very much a priority of this administration in his outdoors for all initiative. Um, and, and helping to try to um, help marginalize, more marginalized households and communities to access nature. Um, and we'll see, um, you know, I should, have, I should have indicated that even though the budget is the budget, there's gonna be an opportunity for a revise it's in May, obviously predicated on revenues. And, and this is not the final say, the legislature hasn't even weighed in quite yet. And, and frankly, the cuts that I described, these were legislatively initiated cuts. They were not the administration's initiated cuts next year. So there's um, they're a little worked up in the in the legislature. And I think they're going to try to do their best to try to claw back um, some of those funds. Um, on other matters, as I noted. In my budget remarks, governor proposed the elimination of funding for non-motorized uh, natural surface trails through the REC Trails program. 
The gentleman that spearheaded that last year, is, his name is Assembly Member Steve Bennett from Ventura. He has now been assigned to chair Assembly Subcommittee 3, which holds jurisdiction over all resources, water, transportation related expenditures in the budget. So he's really nicely positioned to um, dig in a little bit and see if he can't, again, claw back some of those funding for some of that funding for Rec Trail. And he's, he's expressed so much interest in this topic that uh, he's reached out to a client of mine who's in, in California Park and Recreation Society to work with him in sponsoring legislation for the upcoming year to try to create more sustainable funding around uh, recreational trails uh, in the coming year. And uh, it won't be, obviously, with the budget condition, it won't be uh, asking for general fund or new revenues. It's gonna be a redirection of some existing revenues. So look forward to working with you, your GR team, uh, to try to move this legislation forward and, and infuse you know, our, our trails and trail networks systems, more money into those systems. Eric, would you make sure that Director Mercurio is on the, um, copy list for all the, the state trails issues that are coming out of Sacramento? Yeah, sure. So any questions of Doug, comments before we move on? This See is that. really informative, um, yeah. so thank you. And I, I believe we'll be meeting you next week in Sacramento, is that correct? All right, I look forward My to understanding. it. I look forward to it. Yeah, you know, it's been, it's been a few years. Has been a while. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, recommended uh, legislative programs updates. Eric. Yeah, thanks, um, Chair Coffey. Uh, very light this, this early in the year uh, after a new Congress has started and convened and obviously a new legislator, legislature has convened. So we really only had one bill that came before us prior to uh, submitting board material for, for this meeting. And that had to deal with the timely issue of atmospheric river forecasting. Um, and Doug could, can correct me if I'm not correct, but I think this is a bill that basically uh, is, is a bit of a spot bill uh, calling on the water resources uh, Department of Water Resources to develop uh, more specialized mechanisms to forecast these types of uh, historic events, which may be more frequent. Uh, and I, I think that the forecasting was pretty good, but I think um, folks that are, are trying to do advanced planning and, and trying to also, uh, I think, as, as Olivia said, build back better uh, when we're building trails and things like that, uh, taking into account um, when these storms could happen, we want to make sure that we're uh, building trails to to prevent erosion and mudslides as much as we can. Uh, I know uh, Director Waspy uh, shared with us a segment of trail in Lake Chabot that was completely uh, mudslide over and our staff was out there working. And so it's one of those issues where uh, lots of funding going into repairing after the damages from the floods. So being able to forecast ahead of time and also understanding what these events do, just like climate change, um, building some resiliency is something that I think is important to all public agencies. So with that, um, we would recommend supporting the bill as a, um, as a step forward. Um, and I'm sure it will be the last uh, piece of legislation on this issue. Director Sandler. Yeah, I have a question. I, I heard something, and again, this might actually go to federal. I'm not sure the atmospheric river tracking um, difference if it's National Weather Service, but I heard um, from some of my contacts on the within the water agency side that uh, there's some interest or some plans for Los Trompas to be host to a um, like a mid-range tracker to help determine uh, 
and sense and help forecast how much rain is actually going to be falling on the ground. Cause right now, most of the tracking is more upper atmosphere. And so I don't know if this is something that we're familiar with at the park district, but the person who brought it up to me uh, did mention Las Trompas. And, and um, I, I was just curious uh, to see if this is something that we've discussed. Uh, it's, it was the first I had heard of this. It's not I, it's the first that I've heard of it, um, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been raised um, and we don't have any. You only have government affairs folks on the, on the screen right now. <laughs> Peter, anything? Uh, nothing that I've heard, but there is additional new funding within National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, that maybe they're thinking about deploying it there in collaboration with the Bureau of Reclamation. So, um, I, but I haven't heard of it specifically, uh, but there, there is new technology and additional funding uh, for the agency they may be choosing to deploy there. All right. Thank you, Peter. So do I have a motion to Approve the recommendation of support for AB 30. So moved. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Flora, please call the roll of the committee. Absolutely, Chair Coffey. Director San Wong. Yes. San Wong, yes. Director Waspy. Yes. Waspy, yes. And Chair Coffey. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. No recommended oppose and no recommended watch. So we'll move on to projects and programs, annual voter survey update, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the update is, there's not much of an update yet. Uh, we do have a survey drafted um, and is prepared by Tulchin Research and uh, could go into the field uh, whenever we, uh, when, when we think it's uh, the right time, uh, but we have not put it in the field yet. And it's, um, it is a voter survey and it does uh, ask questions about uh, potential measures and, um, and that type of thing and attitudes towards um, specific uh, categories of projects uh, that the Park District works on. Lisa, you popped up. Did you have more to add? Nope, but happy to help answer questions. questions i would just urge you to make sure the board knows you're working on this so if any of us have some suggestions um we could uh we could share them with you any other dennis well yeah I, I i i enjoy these surveys i think they're very valuable i hope we don't let this one slide uh i think having a survey every year or or per periodically and 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 um, just gives us ideas of how trends are changing, what people, if people are changing what they need from the park district or what they want or some of their um, their willingness to support us in a, in a bond or a parcel tax measure. Uh, I, I think they're very important. These are these are great documents that we can use as historical documents and, and try to find some trends. And, and uh, I, I hope we continue with this. Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, last item is site visits meetings. Hayward, we had a recent uh, site visit. Well, I'd like to ask um, Flora to, to, to highlight it, but Director Waspy, is there, uh, this was your inspiration. Is there anything you would like to, uh, to say before we give a more formal report? Well, I, I, I just appreciate all your or your groundwork and and yeah, it was my inspiration. I know you guys had an idea that it was a tour of legislators. I sort of coupled in and th through my HASPA um, uh, affiliation, and I, I just wanted everybody to see the, the King Tides. I, I think it's the graphic example of what we expect to occur with, with uh, sea level rise and uh, 
as much as I was saddened that the uh, waves weren't breaking over the, the levees we were walking on, uh, it was a, a very swollen, swollen bay, uh, and, and people could understand what was going on. People could see power lines that will be inundated. People could see Oraloma Sanitary District that will be, you know, it was right there at sea level, but it it'll be underwater. Uh, we pointed out uh, rail lines. Uh, we pointed, you know, especially in the Hayward area, there's so much uh, industrial stuff and, and infrastructure down by the short line, which won't be there anymore. More. Uh, so I thought it was very graphic and I loved it. I apologize if I kind of cut into the, the legislative angle of it. And I know we had some issues of whether or not that would be a public meeting. Uh, I think we can, uh, I don't know if we want to separate the two in the future of visiting a park and showing off what's going on or holding a legislative uh, uh, tour where we can advocate uh, more closely with our legislators. I personally think we got a lot of, whole lot of people out there, which was great and a whole lot of, of interaction between uh, different folks. I, I know that that gentleman from uh, the governor's office, I think he handed a card to everybody and said that he wants to participate with us and he wants to join us and he was very, he liked the whole visual stimulus of what was going on there. Uh, I don't think we would have met him uh, or I wouldn't have uh, without this type of meeting. Um, so I was very happy with it. I think uh, we can overcome the obstacles of the, of, uh, the act of posting it as a meeting. And, and uh, I think it went really very smoothly and, and very successfully. So thanks very much. Thank you. Or would you would you or, be? Yeah. Uh, I will just add a, a thanks to Director Mercurio and Director San Wong for attending, along with Director Waspy. Uh, Director Corbett was also in attendance, and we did have over sixty attendees, counting Park District staff. I was particularly excited that we had about fourteen legislative offices represented, five federal seven from the state level and two local offices. I think that speaks to the park district's partnerships and the strength of our intergovernmental collaboration. And that when we, that people love our parks, when we invite them, they can't wait to come on a, on a sunny morning and spend the day with us. Uh, I found Director Waspy's uh, story particularly powerful. People remember personal experiences that they have in our parks with their family uh, and how these parks change over time. I know that a number of legislative staff who were there um, uh, responded positively. They followed up to say thank you to our team. Uh, so I, I know that... Um, uh, Eric, Lisa, and Yuli, and I all want to pass on that thanks to the board and to those who attended. It was it was really a, a well received site visit, and um, as mentioned, these are quarterly, so this will hopefully continue in in perpetuity. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning the the fact that they're quarterly, uh, Flora. We will be doing. Uh, for a year, uh, this year, one of those is considered our, our luncheon in um, uh, Sacramento, but we will be uh, continuing this work. And it's really uh, important in terms of the working relationship with staff uh, so that when we do want to advocate for policy or legislation or funding, um, that they not only know us, but they know our, our properties and our parks and uh, appreciate them and, and, and our staff um, that works in the field so that, that it just makes our job easier when we're, when we're doing those sub substantive uh, asks and pursuits. Understood. Thank you. Sounds like a great event. Uh, other matters, Eric? Uh, I think we've, um, talked enough about Sacramento, but uh, if there are any questions between now and Tuesday, feel free to give give me give me or Lisa a call or any one of us, frankly, um, and we're happy to try to help out. Terrific, thank you. Open forum, public comments. Do we have any requests for public comment, Flora? We do not have any requests, Chair Coffee. 
I do not see any in the Zoom room. It's all us. <laughs> it's a, it's an inside group at this point. Um, anything to highlight from articles and social media, Eric? Uh, there was on social media floor. There were some um, posts and re reposts of the Hayward event. Correct. Uh, that is correct. We uh, got some great positive feedback about the, the photos that we posted to the Government Affairs Twitter page, uh, and independently Assembly member Liz Ortega also posted uh, photos of the site visit, um, a couple of offices um, and, and regional partners interacted with the Twitter post as well. Uh, and then just a nice mention from Supervisor David Hobbert's office, encouraging folks in general to come to the parks um, in the new year and to to hike and be active uh, with our with these amazing local resources. So some great some great traction online in the past few weeks. Sounds good. Uh, board comments to before we adjourn. Anything uh, to add, Olivia? Yes, I'll mention um, I did write a guest opinion article today in the Pleasanton Weekly about shadow cliffs and the water level at shadow cliffs, since this was a um, big topic of conversation where I live. And uh, you're welcome to look at it. Maybe I'll send around a link <laughs> if I feel confident <laughs> that it's out there. Um, yes, yes. But I, I did mention the chain of lakes pipeline. I know this was brought up when there was the board site visit. Uh, back in the fall. And um, and I do think that there's a connection in regards to the Del Val conversation. So certainly uh, as we move forward, I can talk a little bit more about that. I'll keep it brief for today. But then my final point of this is, you know, I did have an opportunity to speak with my predecessor, uh, Ann Wieskamp, and she shared with me how um, back in the 1990s, when she was on the Livermore City Council, there was a sand and gravel committee that she was a part of. And so I, I believe when thinking about Shadow Cliffs, the Chain of Lakes pipeline, and also what's happening at Del Val in terms of the water levels, there may be something in regards to this um, sand and gravel committee that could help uh, in terms of going forward and in terms of having these conversations. So uh, I'll keep you all informed as uh, I look into this a bit more. Well, please do. That's very helpful, especially for me. I'm at the other end of the district, so I, I'm always catching up with the with of these uh, histories and the, the uh, educational background on Chain of Lakes and, and Shadow Cliffs. So I, I would much appreciate it. Dennis, any closing thoughts? Well, just uh, I, I would like us to remember the uh, great celebration we had for the swearing in ceremony um, a week and a half ago or whenever it was. But uh, I think that's a testament to the Legislative Committee and Government Affairs Committee. I mean, we had uh, Congressman Desaunier come here and, and swear us in. I don't think that's happened. And I had some old members, board members told me, geez, we've never had that happen before. And and uh, Director Mercurio brought some uh, political folks that were, uh, I think, impressed. I think some during the break, uh, somebody told me what a great organization we had and things like that. I think it's just a testament to what we do here and our relationships with um, electeds is, is really good. And I, we do it on every level. And I was very happy about that. Yeah, so was I. I thought it was great. I mean, we got some good coverage in social media, speaking of social media for, for that event. Uh, I felt bad, by the way, John uh, just mentioned, we didn't get an opportunity to introduce some of the local officials that were at that meeting um, because we are on such a tight schedule with the mark. I mean, we literally had minutes ticking off and had to cut some stuff out and didn't have time to introduce all those people. So I was, I, I felt badly about that, but you know, that's just the way that went. Ordinarily, we would make sure we recognize local officials that attend our meetings as a matter of course. Um, any, anything further or we'll just adjourn. I wanna thank Peter and Doug for attending. And I wanna uh, thank Eric and Flora for all your work and uh, the materials and, and prep for the meeting. And Alex and, and Yuli for getting this meeting working, uh, which I, we all really appreciate. And uh, it went very smoothly. It's a good meeting. Thank you all.
And, and Colin, right before you adjourn, just want to make yeah. sure we also thank Lisa for all of her hard work. She's really done a lot to organize our Sacramento trip. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. We look forward to it. Thank you, Lisa. All right, so we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.